Hello and welcome to Murder Analyzed, I'm Christina Moore. Now today's case is the case of Delroy Grant. Now you also may know this case as the Night Stalker. There's a few Night Stalkers around the world. This is the UK case and he is a serial rapist. So this case isn't about murder, even though it should be, really in the end when we look at what he did, but he is a serial rapist. This case is disturbing. This case is a case that if you are worried about things like this or that you think that, that the subject matter of the rape of not just women but of men is going to affect you, then you should turn off now. So, Delroy, Delroy Grant, he was, um, I think suspected of over a hundred rapes in the London area and um, his reign I think lasted, started in about 1992 and ended in 2009. So I think in this case what we're going to look at is the rapes, um, his, the victimology, so the ages of the rapes. Now these rapes were done on women and men who, in the legal term, would be geriatric of age, so older. I think between 68 was his youngest victim and 98 was his oldest victim. This is a shocking case, this. A lot of his victims had mental health issues. They certainly had physical issues, illnesses. Um, most of them suffered terribly with arthritis. So they were already vulnerable people with quite severe illnesses that would restrict their movements, that would restrict them from um, doing a lot of things to protect themselves. Every one of his victims lived alone and he would stalk his victims for quite a while to make sure that he could spend his time with these victims in their own property. He would break in through a window. He would actually sometimes even take the window pane out or the surrounding wood and then take the pane out to get in to these houses and rape these elderly women and men. So this is a shocking case, this. But I want to also talk about maybe why Delroy Grant had this fascination with the elderly and also why he maybe raped them but again it's a theory really because he isn't, doesn't really say about it but it's more theory of what it could be because his personality and his background and stuff so we'd be looking into that. I don't go into much detail on the victims themselves there is no names of the victims mentioned in this video I know some now have died and some died within a few months after the attack. But I think out of respect for them and their families that um, I've been mentioning no names of the victims at all, men or women. So this case will look at Delroy himself. It will also look at the investigation and the blunders of that investigation that allowed this man to go free for around 10 years when he could have been caught. Um, it also looks at the DNA and how he was caught and that sort of thing. But it also shows you this is a case that I often speak about when you have a person in society that wears this mask of sanity, where on one outside that mask to you and me and to this man's neighbours and people that knew him couldn't believe that this man was a night stalker and had raped over a hundred people. But underneath that mask, there was this deprived, evil sexual offender. So this is a shocking case. So again, if you've got this far and you don't feel comfortable with this case, switch off now. Delroy Grant was born on the 3rd of September 1957. Now he was born in Kingston, Jamaica. Um, so he is a Jamaican convicted rapist and his crimes 
uh, and offences were of burglary, because that's how it sort of started, uh, rape and sexual assault. Uh, and they dated between um, 1992 and, and 2009. Most of his crimes were in South East London. Um, and he was also known as the Minstead, Minstead Rapist. So there's a few things that this man was known as. So if you're going to research this case even more, you know, there's a few names that you can get him under and have a look. But he is mainly known, I think, as a night stalker in the UK. Um, <clears throat> but it's fault, he, he may have done his first crime in 1992, but his fault was probably earlier than that, it was about 1990, when he actually really started to um, probably rape. Because as I say with all these cases, is that these are what we know of. And when you look at his MO and how these people were raped and, and um, where they were raped, there's a lots of outstanding rape cases that could also be put down to this man. So he wasn't convicted of over 100, but it is thought that he had done over 100 rapes of elderly people. So in 1998, the Metropolitan Police um, set up a team, an operations team, and it was called um, Operation uh, Minstead. But it was based out of Lewisham in London because they had so many crimes at that point that they needed now to get this man. So there was a, a dedicated team to this and um, it was failures within that team, human error, I think, because everyone wanted to catch this man, but it was come down to human error, why he wasn't caught, and we will look at that in a little bit further on. So when he started, he, he was born in Jamaica, and um, his mother, when we now look at why maybe, before we go into these cases, actually why Delroy Grant did this, or so why it's thought he could have done this, is that when he was 18 months old, his mother, in Jamaica left him and he was brought up by his father and his grandmother. So this attraction, this need for elderly contact probably came from the grandmother. There's not much else known about that situation because when Delroy was 15, his father then brought him to England and left the grandmother in Jamaica. So there was this then, um, I suppose you could say that he had this mother that left him, so he felt rejected at a very young age. He was then brought up by his grandmother until he was 15. Now Jamaica, at that time in Kingston, I think it still is today, if you haven't got a lot of education and you are trying to get through, I mean, a lot of people go to Jamaica for holidays and we take our money and we have a great time. But to live in some of these countries isn't always easy. So. Delroy's father wanted to give him a better life. So he had to then take him away from his grandmother. And I think this really triggered something in him. It was that trigger uh, that triggered it off. Because he was about 15 when he came to the UK, he moved into London uh, in the UK. And he um, already then started to rob houses, um, theft, this sort of thing. I think when you've come from Jamaica or the life that he was, even though he had a good upbringing, so it seems, on the outside, but I, I would say you never really know, I think this rejection from a young age and then he was took away from his grandmother by the father to the UK, you're in the UK and you've got all this stuff in the UK that everyone else has got and Delroy wanted that. So he couldn't earn it. He, so he stole it. So that's where the robberies started, the theft started from a very, very young age. <clears throat> so he was displaying behaviours um, at a very young age, at 15, and that is probably caused by all these traumatic things that happened to him in his life. And I'd say it's traumatic to a child when you are 18 months old and your mother leaves, you never see her again. Then you have a father bringing you up. You're in, you know, you're brought up with not a lot of money, poverty. A child looks at it different ways than what we would. 
So then the father tries to do his best thing and brings him then to England to try and give him a better life. And he did have a better life, but it was he wanted more. And I think anything for Delroy wouldn't have been enough. And this fascination with the elderly stemmed from the loss of the grandmother at that age of 15. So by 2009, Oper this operation, Minstead, was the biggest operation, the largest ever undertaken by the Metropolitan Police within a rape uh, investigation. Because there were so many now, and they knew his MO, they, they just knew it. They knew that he was attacking women on their own or men on their own. They were elderly, they were vulnerable, and so there was a you know there was a lot going on to try and get this man. So Delroy, I think in about 1992, it was in Shirley and in Croydon, or Shirley of Croy in Croydon, that um, he really started to hone his skills. He 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 was a good burglar. He hadn't been caught um, at that point either for burglary. So he was very good at what he did. But then the burglars took a change then. As he was breaking into these elderly women's homes, he then started to rape them. So how he would get in, I've said before, he would take the window out, or if their window was open, he would get in. But if he couldn't get in by an open window, he would literally take the window out to get him in. He would usually have already cut the phone lines before he'd gone in. And he would also have turned off the electricity or took light bulbs out of the ceiling. And he used to then, to um, surprise his victims, he would shine a torch into their face, which then they couldn't see. So you're talking about very elderly people, very ill people, had medical issues, some had mental health issues, and all of a sudden, standing by their bed was Delroy Grant, this six foot, nine to six foot eleven man, I think he's six foot eleven, uh, five foot eleven man, uh, athletic build and young compared to them. And he seemed to have a knowledge, a lot of the victims said, of how to handle people that were um, unwell or physically unwell or didn't have the ability to move. He would be sometimes very gentle with them to move them into a position where he could rape them. And then he would undo his flies of his trousers and produce his penis. So they knew they was going to be raped, even though at some times, most of the time he told me he wasn't going to rape them, he only wanted to rob them. But it seemed like he, he there was, I think, one victim who he'd done this to, he'd broken into a home, he'd shone, you know, cut, the, uh, cut the electric off, uh, cut the phone line so they couldn't call for help. And then she woke up to this torch in her face and he starts then to undo himself and, and show himself to her. And she said to him, what are you doing? What would your mother think of you doing this? And she said she was so scared but it's just something that come out of her mouth. You're talking about elderly people who have, you know, who should have been given a lot of respect. And it seems that with this victim, he stopped what he was doing. He apologized. He, he just apologized and left. So he did have somewhere in there, some conscience of what he was doing. But then the next, rape that he would go to was terrible. He would do the same, break in, turn the electric off, do the phone lines they couldn't ring out, shine the torch in, move them into a position gently where he could rape them. With this one lady he took her, lifted her up by the elbows because he knew that he couldn't lift her up by her arms because she was so unwell. He walked her into the living room, still telling her that he wasn't going to rape her or do anything to her, apart from rob her. 
and he raped her. And he raped her so badly that her bowel ruptured and she nearly died. So I know I've said that he is just a rapist and there is such a thing in law called causation. But when you look at the legal term of causation, where someone, you could injure someone and then they would die shortly after, you could then maybe follow the, the line across and use causation. I think with the age of these people and also with the time it took to catch this man and also the um, illnesses that they already had, was that rape enough to be put down to causation under the law? No, not really. And I think, not that he would have known anything about the law, I think there would have been many, many lawyers that would want to have prosecuted this man for manslaughter, because um, I think that's all you would have got him on. But to rape a woman of 93 so badly that you've ruptured her bowel. So we're not just talking about vaginal rape here. We're talking about anal rape of someone of 93 and you expect them to live. So these crimes were getting more and more dangerous. He was escalating. Sometimes he would go in and he would be gently rape them, gently. Now this is from what the victims have said that, and some of these victims, because don't forget, these are elderly victims that have actually thanked him for not hurting them. So he knew what to do. He knew how elderly people's body reacted to things. And they did thank him. And some people have also said that they didn't want to report it that night because they didn't want to waste police time. So we are talking about a culture now of the elderly people that don't want to bother police. They feel police have got more to do. They wasn't injured, but they were raped. And because they were elderly, one is the embarrassment also of that. And I know with the men victims, the male victims here, they were abused so severely by this man and they did come forward. It's shocking. So not many, no one of these victims is alive today. But some did die very, very shortly after these attacks. And as I said before, these attacks went on and on and on for years. Now Delroy Grant did take breaks. So let's look now at Delroy's personal life to see if there's any clues there of why he took these breaks or did he take these breaks or is there his other you know because they think he's took breaks but we can't don't know if he's took a few years break from it he wasn't in prison at the time of these breaks what the police are saying so that's what people thought he was either in prison or he died because they stopped for a few years but then they'd start again but he wasn't in prison but what he had he had a life apart from this life this mask of sanity, what I say to all of you, this was his life that somehow kept him and gave people a break from this man. Because if this man hadn't have took these breaks, God knows how many rapes and murders, because in the end he would have killed someone that we would have got. <clears throat> so Delroy Grant was married twice. Now the first marriage only lasted um, a short time, good for a few years. He had two children in that first marriage and his ex-wife has said that being married to Delroy Grant wasn't easy and he was a violent domestic abuser as well. He also had this um, thing where, where everything had to be spotlessly clean. So um, even a, if a knife and forks were washed up and they had a little bit of a watermark on them, he would lose it. He would beat her for that. His life or her life with him 
was dictated by Delroy Grant. Everything had to be his way. There was no way that this woman had a life of her own. And this marriage didn't last that long from the minute I think she met him. Um, and within three weeks, they were engaged and things. And I always say that when you meet these men, now Delroy wasn't a bad looking man. He was an Afro-Caribbean man. He was, you know, as I said, um, athletic build. He was um, about six foot, uh, five foot 11. Um, he came across as this nice, nice man even to this woman but after three weeks she then um sort of really got serious with him married him very very quickly and that ended because really she didn't really know this man and this man made her life hell this first marriage and she ended up divorcing him and um leaving him really not having much to do with him at all because he was so violent within this relationship he then met another lady and I don't like to use names of wives it's not important I think especially with this one because again she had children with this man she was a Jehovah Witness and she was very religious a very nice girl and he seemed to be better with this woman they got married they seemed to have on the outside to what everyone could see this happy life Delroy Grant was a care assistant and worked in a nursing home for a very, very long time, many, many years he worked in a nursing home. So this is where his knowledge later on comes out of how he could handle you know, um, these victims with care without damaging them before he raped them. So he has definitely had this fascination with the elderly. Now, a lot of elderly people in nursing homes are incapacitated. So I don't know what was going on and we will never know what was going on with Delroy Grant in this nursing home or any other nursing home that he may have worked in. Because at that time, he wasn't under suspicion for anything he had no criminal record, he'd never been really caught, especially for anything like that. But he was a care assistant and he was a care assistant for many years until he couldn't do that anymore because his wife, this very nice woman, had got MS. And as her MS got worse and worse, she ended up in a wheelchair. And now we have Delroy Grant, this perfect husband, this perfect father, looking now, being this woman's carer. And the neighbours loved him, the locals loved him, this mask of sanity. This is what this man was like. He occasionally then did um, taxi work as well, taxi driving work in the evenings to make extra money to keep his family going. He was in the community of the Strait of Witnesses because his wife was a Jehovah's Witness and the, they had supported him and helped him. This man was a very, very well-liked man within the community. He would do anything for you. He would help you if you was his neighbours. He, 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 he came across as this dedicated man that would do anything for a woman. And yet he was one of the biggest rapists, the most serial rapist in this country that we've ever seen. So that's why I'm saying about this mask of sanity. People may look good, good looking, well looked after, well mannered, helpful, caring, but it's what's underneath that didn't come out for many years. And when it came out that Delroy Gray, Grant was this night stalker, People could not believe it. People could not believe it that much that they thought it was a mistake. That's how good this man was. So in 1992, the first bit of DNA was found from this Night Stalker rapist. At the time, no one knew. 
it was uh, Delroy. So DNA was around then in 1992 without a doubt and they had it, they had the DNA and they knew then that at least 30 rapes, he had had, I think he'd done 30 rapes that they knew of at that time uh, around, you know, coming up to where this investigation was getting to its peak. Um, and I think about 24 uh, assaults as well, other just uh, assaults, sexual assaults uh, and burglaries and stuff. So they had now DNA in, two, in 1992. One, on, really, they had it on, on it really maybe two years after he started doing this. And as he went through, and the breaks now we know were because he had a sick wife and he was working and he had other things on his mind. But I always say I don't believe he had these breaks. It wasn't a constant break. Delroy Grant, there was no way he took a four-year break. There was something. And a lot of victims, as I've said in rape, especially if you're a man, do not report rapes. They don't. So I don't believe he had this big break. I think he had certain breaks, maybe shorter times, but this man was offending even then because he couldn't help himself. There was no way that this man was going to stop raping vulnerable victims. So yes, he was married. He was looking after this woman. He'd worked in a nursing home. He was now a carer for his wife at home and his children. We already know his personality was very violent even at home and we don't know about this wife because I don't know with the second marriage if she gave him any cause or in his mind gave him any cause to be violent because you know usually with domestic violence it's your fault. So I think this woman, the second marriage, she was a very placid woman, she was an ill woman he liked this idea of looking after her. And really, let's be honest, she had MS, she was wheelchair bound, bound. She was totally dependent on this man. Totally dependent. And this is the sort of dependency this man liked. So we won't really know in detail, or we don't really know in detail, what it was really like in this household. But I doubt as it as it was if it was as happy as people like to think it was. The other thing with Delroy Grant is his intelligence. He never left a fingerprint, always wore gloves, always wore dark clothing, a mask or a cap. He shone the light in their eyes so they couldn't really see him. So the description that the victims were given to police were of a man that was of an um, athletic sort of uh, slim build. Um, he was between, I think, the age of 25 and 40. He was between 5 foot 9 and 5 foot 11. He was always used to wear dark clothing, um, caps and, and stuff like that. He spoke with um, a very calm and he was well-spoken voice. He never really um, shown anger in that way at the beginning of the crime um, or the attack. That usually came later. So he was this well-spoken man. He used to apologise because he, you know, he didn't want to do it, and he was going to try and stop. And then he would rob them and say, "I apologise to that." But then he'd also rob them and chuck their clothes, uh, their money away down the road. He never took it home. He sometimes would take their pin uh, for their cards, their credit cards or their bank cards. He did then go to banks and, and draw money out sometimes from that, but not always. Sometimes he took the bank cards, got the pin from these people and never used them. So this man, was he a thief? He was certainly a rapist. But I think when you try and look at this case, and it's a big case, this actually, more than what I could get in here. But when you look at this man's personality, obviously he had times when he didn't do things or, or what we suspect. But when he did, at first it was nicely spoken, you know, and um, 
I'm not going to rob you, I don't mean to rob you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But as he got on and on and on, and as I say this with many criminals, as especially where they start off with rape or sexual assaults and stuff like that, they escalate up. He was escalating because his crimes were getting much more severe. You know, the victim MO was, or victimology was now men and women. So yes, he may have had this fascination or this felt this loss of his grandmother. We know he had felt this loss of his mother when he was 18 months old. But where did the elderly men come into it? And this is the thing when you look at predators and you look at when you're trying to profile someone. So yes, we've got the areas right because he didn't really go out of his areas. I think only one time or a few times he'd gone to a certain area. But there would have been a reason why he'd gone there. But most of his crimes were in um, London area. So most of his crimes were in Shirley and Croydon, um, Orpington, um, Forest Hill, Catford, Brockley. Now I was born in Brockley, London. Thank God, I just don't, you know, still live there when this was going on. Uh, Bromley, Beckenham, um, Dulwich and Sidcup. So he's, he, he covered a good few areas. Now, in London, if you're a taxi driver, and at certain points in this time, he was a taxi driver when he was looking after his wife at home, you know, in the evenings, he would go out to earn more money, to, was a taxi driver. And this sort of looks in this area, you know, this group of areas where you could say a taxi driver or someone, because they're sort of quite close, you know, there's not, you know, they're quite close areas, these, it's all south, uh, south east London. And a taxi driver, if you, you were thinking, you would be looking at someone that lived, you know, close. Well, he actually lived in Brockley in London. So he really, his, you know, geographical span when we look at it in your profiling, when you're looking at your five mile radius, he was definitely with, within that, especially in London where you can get to one place to another quite quickly. Not so much when you're driving, but obviously by the tube and stuff like that. So from a, when you're looking at, when you're profiling someone like him, you would know he would live in one of them areas and he actually lived in uh, Brockley in London. So there was one, I think, which was in Greater London and that was in uh, Wallington in Surrey. And they think he did that one as well. But as they said, there must have been some connection or something. You, you don't know with him, he was taxi driving at the time. He could have got a cab, you know, a fare to take, to go out to Surrey somewhere, but he did. And, and there was rapes there as well. But mainly he's, he was in these other areas in uh, South East London. And that's really where he worked. Very rarely, and it's very rare, and they said, um, you know, uh, lorry drivers or something else, that they would come out of their, their areas of where they live. Because the thing is, is when you have a, a predator like him, who is this rapist, and he also took time to, you know, put surveillance really on this, these people. He raped actually one night in one street, free, elderly people in one street in one night because when he was surveilling one he must have noticed the other two so this man would have probably only stuck to his where he knew because one then he had time to look sit and watch he would have known his exit routes without getting caught so this man was intelligent because one no he didn't um leave any fingerprints so I think he left a footprint that was one of their things it was a Nike Air trainer or whatever they they found um, a footprint that's about the only evidence they found but this man you see wasn't as bright as he thought he was he wasn't as intelligent as he thought he was because even though DNA in 1992 was around it wasn't that advertised was it it hadn't been used really to, for criminals. And we've spoke about um, the first case of DNA where it was used to convict someone. And so Delroy Grant was before that time. So Delroy Grant 
never used a condom. So the DNA they got, the, the, the bit that should have got him a lot earlier than when he was caught, was the DNA. Now this, this police force, this police this task force at the time, wanted to do a mass um, sort of screening in these areas of Afro-Caribbean men. Because they knew by the DNA that that what was coming up it could even tell in them days, sort of your background, your heritage, you know, your, your, your culture, where you come from. And also that the victims had said there was a, they could smell this sweet smell coming from him. So they put it down to this, he was of um, Afro-Caribbean descent. That was proven. The problem is, is when you have officers that want to then do a mass screening. So these Afro-Caribbean culture and, and these um, people in London, yes, they didn't mind having their DNA taken and they said, we'll take your DNA and we just want to check it and then we're going to get rid of it, which is legally what they have to do. But I think we had a lot of complaints about they were then being targeted as because of their race. So I think they had to be very careful in what they do. So that really didn't work out. We had a lot of men, and, and give them that, a lot of Afro-Caribbean men from this area came and gave their DNA willingly to help stop this rapist, because this is how bad he was. There was about a 1,000 people. I think there was 26,000 people in total that they needed to do a screening of DNA. And I think it was a thousand people out of that 26 that refused to do it for principal reasons, you know, their own principles. And also they didn't, it wasn't under any legal obligation to give their DNA. It was just to help in this case. And it was guaranteed that their DNA then would be um, discarded once that had been done. So we had a thousand people now left in this sort of area. And Delroy Grant would have been one of them thousand that had refused to give their DNA. I've spoken about the National Database, DNA National Database, in many other cases. It really, this really was set up in about 1995, so we didn't have this database until 1995, and even then it was, as it was growing, you know, it would be put into anyone in prison then would have had their DNA taken and put on this database, anyone charged with an offence or arrested on an offence, or at that time even witness to an offence, would have DNA would have been taken, depending on. So in 1999, there was a burglary in Brockley, London, and a witness had seen someone acting very suspiciously, and they were in a BMW car. Now what they'd done, luckily for them, for the police, you would hope, was to take down the registration number of that car, and when the police looked through the DVLA, it belonged to a man called Leroy Grant. So when they talked to Leroy Grant, there was, they noticed there was a lot of similarities between what had been said about the Night Stalker and him. Because, well, he really was the Night Stalker. But you had this rookie cop, a new copper, a new police officer, that really wasn't didn't have enough experience and didn't do his job right when it concerned this man. And this is the main failure in 1999 that allowed this man, Delroy Grant, to continue to rape victims until 2009. And now I'm going to tell you <laughs> what the mistake was. So we have this rookie detective that looks for the name Leroy Grant. Now, Leroy Grant isn't a name which you'd have loads of in the area, or so you'd think. So he's gone to this address and he's took the DNA of Leroy Grant and he was a black man, 
very similar in looking to the Night Stalker. He's then run the DNA and that DNA has come back that it wasn't the match for the DNA of the rapes. So Leroy Grant, this Leroy Grant, that this police officer had just took on <laughs> by name only, not really checking anything else if it was the right Delroy Grant has now eliminated this Delroy Grant as a suspect in all these rapes in 1999. Unbeknownst to him or any other police officers that the man that he was questioning was Delroy Grant. It was just the wrong one. And because the follow-on checks, the other questions that an experienced officer, an experienced investigator would ask. He didn't ask. He just got the name, he found the name, and it could have been anyone called Leroy Grant. And it just happens that this Leroy Grant, Grant was black, looked very similar, and so here do. Without doing other checks to make sure it was the right Leroy Grant. So now in 1999, the rapist, the serial rapist, Leroy Grant is still free and of course this man Leroy Grant is exonerated because his DNA does not match that of the rapist. So then in 2004 we have other um, sightings of people and that match this description and also registration numbers taken but of course the registration number comes back as Leroy Grant. So again, in 2004, the police look, well, Leroy Grant, we know it's not him because his DNA doesn't match the rapist. So again, he's let go and he's not even really actually even questioned for it because they've already eliminated him in 1999, but they'd eliminated the wrong bloody man. So this man went on to rape and rape and rape <laughs> terribly. And one of his last rapes in 1998 was the woman who's had a perforated bowel because of the viciousness of this attack. Plus others, and there are other rapes that we don't know about that have never been reported. This is an absolute shocking, shocking case this. Blunder and blunders and blunders. Even though this man never used a condom. They had the DNA. They had the man really, as far as they were concerned, but he didn't do it because they had the wrong bloody man. I mean this is the biggest blunder when you think about it. When you have run one of the biggest investigations this country had ever seen. A rape a, a, a serial rapist that would have accelerated in the end if he had continued to murder. So on the 15th of November 2009 it was reported that a 52 year old man had been arrested in connection over a hundred sexual offences in South East London um, and detectives, detectives at the time said this was significant so everyone I think then realised that this night stalker had been caught and he, he had been. It was Delroy Grant, the actual real serial rapist, had actually been caught on the 15th of November 2009. Now Delroy, this 52 year old man in November at that time lived in Brockley, uh, South East London. Uh, he was actually charged I think with 22 offences and appeared at Greenwich Magistrates Court. Um, on the 16th of November. So he's, he's now starting to go to trial. On the 8th of February 2010, he was actually then, um, his trial started. And I think this is where a lot of this evidence and stuff had come out and the blunders and stuff had come out. And it, I, I, I hate to say it when, um, with the police, I think I tried really hard with this, this one, but it was just 
again, it's about education, isn't it? When we when we talk about when a young police officer or an ear, ear, you know uh, um, someone that hasn't got that investigation skill yet, they haven't got that experience yet needed. And I think when now we have cases like this, which are serious, serious cases, you only really have that are running these investigations and are doing the legwork really are serious, um, you know, trained, experienced investigators. And I think if that had been done in 1999, this case would have been solved and many, many people would have survived. It, it's a shocking case, this one really. So on the 1st of March 2011, Woolwich Crown Court, um, uh, I think it, the trial lasted about six weeks, I think. And the charges that Delroy were on, there were so many that I'm going to have to read a few to you. So it was a rape of an 89 year old woman, was count one. Count two was rape of an 80 year, 81 year old woman. Count three was rape of an 82 year old woman. Count four was rape of an 88 year old woman. Count five was indecent assault of a 71 year old woman. Num count six, indecent assault uh, of an 82 year old woman. Uh, it goes on and on and on and on. And as I say, they were ranging from 63 year old to I think 93 or 98 year old. I think there was CCT evidence CCTV evidence as well, because as I said, Delroy Grant would then take bank cards and of course these people were intimidated so much and, and hurt so much that they gave their pin because to them I think they just wanted him out of the house and it's always best just to give them it and let them go. And he was seen on CCTV taking money out of the bank uh, in the area, I think it was uh, the 28th of July in 19. 99 when he was found um, on this CCTV camera after the burglary and assault of an 82 year old in this area. So this court, this this case, no it's not a murder case, never was really, but when you look at his victims and there is many 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 of them and probably many more that we don't know about who were elderly people, mental health, dementia, arthritic, other illnesses and diseases that sh this time should have been a time in their life when they could feel safe and comfortable in their own home. Yet they were raped and abused in such a terrible way, both men and women. I mean, what a way to end your life, really. And this is why I know under the law and under causation that it would have been very difficult to get this man anyway on that. But when you have victims that were so seriously abused, enough to where it ruptured their bowel, dislocated their hips, these were violent, violent crimes that went on for years to the most vulnerable of our society. And this is what makes this for me one of the most shocking cases. And you have this man that portrays himself as this caring, loving family man who worked in a nursing home for many years, that lived within a community of Brockley in London that felt that he was this perfect husband, father, member of the public, member of their community, member of a church community. And underneath all that, he was probably one of the most evil criminals I've ever read about. And if he hadn't have been caught, I think he would have escalated because his, the violence was escalating. So I'm only assuming of why he would have done this, what his fascination was with the elderly 
I think it does stem back from the childhood of when he was left by his mother at 18 months old, brought up by the grandmother, and then took away from the grandmother at 15. So Delroy Grant, I think on the 24th of March 2011, was found guilty of all the offences, and there was many of them, too many for me to continue on with the counts, and it, it was loads of rape and theft and, and, and assault and stuff. And he was given, um, I think, he was given life, concurrent life sentences, and he would have to serve a minimum of 27 years before applying for parole. Now, <laughs> You know, as I say, he was 52, he was 62, 72, 80 odd. I don't think he's going to make it to come out. And I don't think the parole board's probably going to let him out, to tell you the truth. Uh, and I hope they don't. So again, this is a shocking case of the serial rapist, of Delroy Grant. It's a UK case, London case again, but a shocking case. And I hope that you found this case interesting. And I hope that you um, do your thumbs up, the like button. You can subscribe to us on um, our logo, what Lacey puts up. You can follow us on Instagram and on Facebook. It has been great to have all your comments. And I'm sure I'm going to get some comments on this one. But as again, I say this is a disturbing case. This is a totally disturbing case and it's a case that shouldn't have gone on as long as it did and yes you can say there was blunders but I think really in the end they caught him in the end they got him in the end so thank you for watching this case till the next time bye bye